Lord Jesus, will you please reveal yourself to us tonight? Open your words so that we understand. We don't want to just read words and talk about stuff. We need revelation knowledge. So we're asking you humbly, Father, that you would just step in and you would speak through my mouth and that you would anoint these words, the Lord, and they would become part of our life, that we might know you better. It is our desire and our prayer tonight, Lord. Let's start off in Ephesians chapter 1. Um, we talked about it before, but we're going to read the Ephesians prayer from Ephesians 1 again, starting at verse 15. Ephesians chapter 1. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you. While making mention of you in my prayers, now here comes Paul's prayer, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart or your understanding may be enlightened, so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. A lot of stuff there. We're not going to talk about all of it, but we're talking tonight specifically about the power of God. We started a series. We want to talk about who God is, what he's like, so we get to know him better. So we understand him better. And just from this, I, there's a couple really important verses we want to pull out first. One of the part, of Paul, part of Paul's prayer is that we would know the surpassing greatness of his power, but not just there, toward us who believe. So all this tremendous, overwhelming power he's using for our benefit. So if you say, God, can you do this thing for me? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's done way worse. He's done way bigger. He uses that power toward us. And then this other one, look down at verse 21. When Jesus rose from the dead, he was seated far above, not just above, but far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. What's he talking about? He's talking about the devil. He's talking about every human government, everyone who insists that they have to say so. I'm going to tell you what to do, and I'm going to make your life miserable. Devil, okay, devil using people, or whoever. Jesus is far above that. Far above that. And look at 22. This makes me really happy. He put all things in subjection under his feet. Whose feet? Jesus' feet. So we're talking about anything the devil throws at you, it's under the feet of Jesus. If the devil's trying to say, I'm, you're not going to get a job, you're not going to get a house, you're not going to make a living, you're not going to be healthy, you're not going to live your life out, say, shut up, devil. Jesus told you to. It's under his feet. He protects me. He heals me. He provides for me. I have more than enough. You can't keep it away. We got to have that much confidence because all things are under Jesus' feet. And who are we? We're his church. We're part of his body. Well, if it's under Jesus' feet and we're part of his body, then it's under our feet too. Anything the devil throws at you, under your feet. Right there. So let's look at just a couple of verses about the power of God. I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 1. I think this is a good starting place. The very, very beginning. And we're not reading the whole thing, but we're just picking out some verses, parts of verses. I just want you to notice a pattern here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, how did God do it? Well, let's look at verse 3. Then God said, and there was. Down at verse 6. Then God said, 
And it was. Now, and then God said, and it was so. Over and over, I got a whole big long list of how many times God said, and that says, and it was so. God just had to say it. He didn't have to stand there for hours and days and weeks and months and years and say, man, I got to make that cow. That cow's kind of difficult out now. How many strands of hair should I put in its tail and how many stomachs should it have? It wasn't hard for God. He spoke, let there be, and it was. That's the power of God. I want to see the devil do that. He can't. He didn't have that kind of power. God does. He said, let let it be, and it was so. I think it's worth just thinking about. And, by the way, verse 31, God saw all he had made, and behold, it was very good. He only made good things. Anything that's not good, anything that's evil, averted, twisted, making sick and destroying, that's not God. He only made very good. Another place where we see the power of God. This is quite interesting, I think. Exodus 19. He had just brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, and God was getting ready to tell them the law. But these are people that didn't know the law of God yet. But they were a pretty rebellious group. Not easy to lead. So God decided to um, show them just a little bit of what he was like. So they'd have some respect. Exodus chapter 19. Uh, he told them, I'll be there on this mountain. And three days from now, everybody take a bath. Don't touch the mountain. Not even an animal goes near the mountain. Nothing. Perfect. Waiting. So on the third day, verse 16. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon a mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Thunder, lightning, trumpets. So after he gives the Ten Commandments, we skip over to chapter 20. Let's see how the people responded to that. Of course, he starts out, I am the Lord your God. He told him who he was. No question, no doubt here. Who's talking? Who sent the thunder and the smoke and the, all that stuff? I am the Lord your God. And when he was done giving him the Ten Commandments, down to verse 18 in chapter 20, it says, And all the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we'll listen, but let not God speak to us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. But God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen that I've spoken to you from heaven. You shall not make other gods beside me. Gods of silver or gods of gold you shall not make for yourselves. God was trying to impress them with something. I'm God. They had all kind of idols around them, and people claimed all kind of things. I'm sure there were all kind of superstitions and lies and stories made up. Well, that God will give you this, and that God will give you that. But they never could, could they? And people did horribly wicked things to try to appease these gods. They killed their children. They did nasty things. God said, that is not who I am. I am God. And this is what you're going to do. Sometimes we need to have a little taste of the power of God. Learn respect again, because it's so important. In Exodus 34, just a couple chapters later, we talked about it last week. Moses asked, show me your glory, God. And because Moses was a man who talked to him face to face, he was willing to do that. But look how God started off telling him what he was like. Exodus 34. The Lord descended in the cloud, that's verse 5, 
and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers and the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. Oh, yeah, I'd bow low too. God spoke to him from the cloud. But he had to start off saying, I am the Lord. What is the Lord? The one in charge. In other words, I'm the boss. I'm the one you listen to. Forget the rest of them. I know what I'm doing. But right away he says, I'm compassionate. I'm gracious. I'm slow to anger. I'm not a mean God. I'm not up here looking for a way to stomp you and make your life miserable. I'm good. I'm good. But know that if you continue to sin and you live in sin and you refuse to repent, the guilty will be punished. We have to have that much fear of God, too. We love the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the compassion. But know for a fact that if we continue to rebel against him and refuse to repent, there will come a day we will answer for that. I don't want to be in that position. I'm sure you don't either. Let's just obey him today. Let's just follow. He's so good. It's not hard to obey God. It's really not. It's not hard to love him. When someone loves you that much, when someone's that good to you, how could you not love him? That's our God, but powerful. Interesting, in 1 Kings chapter 19, here's another example. This is Elijah. He had just, and we're going to go back and talk about what happened to him there with the prophets of Baal. But at this point, he went out to meet God because he was having a hard time. And uh, 1 Kings 19, starting at verse 11. The Lord spoke to him and said, go forth, stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by and a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. And it came about when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah had a talk with God. But I think this is an important thing. So many times when we want to hear from God, we want something really fantastic. God, how about thunder, wind, earthquakes, fire, do something big and powerful. I need to know something from you, God. I need to hear from your voice. But Elijah was smart enough to know God wasn't in those things. The still small voice. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. He wants us to simply listen to him talk. He showed those impressive things. But because Elijah was a friend, he spoke to him like a man speaks to a friend. I want to be someone that God speaks to quietly. He shouldn't have to yell at me. I don't really like getting yelled at. I'm sure no one else does. If I just listen to God and I pay attention, he doesn't have to yell. Now, there have been times, mm hmm, yeah, when well, you felt like God's yelling. Why is that happen? Because you're being pretty stubborn and, and rebellious. You're not paying attention. And so it feels like God is saying, hey, stop it. You ever felt like that? Like the father giving the spanky. Okay, child, stop it now. Now. Okay, you stopped it. Good. I'm going to tell you how to do this better. He's just correcting because he loves you, because he does not want us to continue on in our rebellion and hurt ourselves. If he just let us do anything we wanted to, we'd be in so much trouble. We're really not that smart that we always know the right thing to do. We need to be listening to what God says. And if he says, stop, don't change, let's stop, don't change. And we'll have the very best. It's like Elijah here. Now, I think this is really interesting, and we're going to go back up one chapter to 1 Kings 18. Elijah had it out with the prophets of Baal. 
again, the prophets of Baal, they were pretty wicked. They did some rotten things. And they've been, basically most of Israel had been worshiping Baal. They turned from God. And so God allowed Moses, uh, not Moses, Elijah to say there will be no rain until I say so. God gave him that authority and it didn't rain for three years. That's authority from God. And by then they were pretty desperate to find Elijah. The king sent soldiers all over. Where's Elijah at? And so he said, okay, I'm going to change this. I'm going to have a showdown with the prophets of Baal. So let's start at verse 21. And Elijah came near to the people, to all the people. They were all there. The people wanted to know what's going on. The prophets of Baal and Elijah. He came near to the people and said, how long will you be hesitant between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people didn't answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen and let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood and I will not put fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered and said, that's a good idea. And they were ready to find out who was really God. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourselves and prepare it first for your many. And call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. And they took the ox which was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning till noon saying, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they'd made. And it came about at noon that Elijah mocked him and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he's a god. Either he's occupied or gone aside. Maybe he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and needs to be awakened. So they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves, according to their custom, with swords and lances, till the blood gushed out of them. Pretty bad. And it came about when midday was past that they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Good demonstration, wasn't it? Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water flowed around the altar. And he also filled the trench with water. I mean, it looked impossible, didn't it? Then it came about at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you alone are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. I guess I would do. Huh? <laughs> yeah, the Lord, he is God. I mean, there's no doubt now. We know who God is. Yeah. God answered with fire, didn't he? Water was not too hard for him. There was nothing. He showed him right there who he was. Why is it so important that we know that our God is greater, that he's powerful? Because the devil constantly comes to say, I got you whipped. You're not going to do this. I'm stronger than you. And look what's happening in, in Washington. And look what's happening in other countries. And then you Christians, yeah, 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 yeah whatever. He, he's always mocking us and lying. He's always been a liar. He wants to intimidate you. He wants to threaten you. He wants to wear you down. But no, he's a liar. He's always been a liar. He's coming to steal and kill and destroy. We're not letting him do it. Jesus is bigger than him. 
And God, our Father, is definitely bigger than him. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. Let's find that. Matthew 18. There we go. Matthew 18. 18. Truly I say to you, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. Two of you agree on earth about anything they may ask. What are we asking? What the Father tells us. We only ask according to the will of God. But if you bind it on earth, it's bound. In the name of Jesus, I bind you, Satan. You will not do this thing. In the name of Jesus, we loose that person from the power of the devil. That kind of authority. That kind of authority Jesus gives to us. Why can Jesus do it? Philippians chapter 2. This is why. Philippians 2. Start at verse 5. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although we existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore also God highly exalted him. And bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Who has to bow before Jesus? Every knee. Every knee. There are no exceptions. There are no exceptions. Every knee should bow. So even if the devil says, hey, you can't get me, say, in the name of Jesus, quiet. Oh, yeah, you're bowing. You will bow to the name of Jesus. He made it that way. And because he delegated that authority to us. Look at Ephesians 6 real quick. This is what we can do. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. So that looks to me like. We're not coming, not falling over, are we? Yeah, we're struggling against the spiritual forces of wickedness. We're struggling against the works of the devil. But he said, you can stand firm against the schemes of the devil. We don't have to put up with his, what he's doing. We don't have to accept it. That's why we pray. That's why we intercede. We pray for the nation. We pray for people we know. Because we don't have to accept or tolerate these things. And God is changing things. We see it around us. John 16, just a couple more, almost there. John 16, 23, what did Jesus say? And in that day you will ask me a question, truly, truly, I say to you, if you shall ask the Father for anything, he will give it to you in my name. Until now you've asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be made full. Jesus gave us this power of attorney, his name. Not my name, not your name, the name of Jesus. If you ask in my name, you will receive. I have a right to ask in Jesus' name. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Not really a question there. Resist him and he will flee. He has to. He has to. He has to. No choice. Remember a story I heard from from Brother Hagin once. He said he was praying for somebody in a service for healing. And he knew this person 
had demonic uh, oppression. And he prayed. Actually, the person, I think, was possessed. He said, I knew that guy was possessed and that that demon was causing this man to be sick. I think he was uh, hunched over or something, something like that. Anyways, he couldn't stand straight. And so he said, well, you come out of that man in Jesus' name. Okay, cast out the devil. And he said to the guy, try to stand straight. Well, the guy tried. Can't do it. So he did it again. Okay, in Jesus' name, get out, devil. Okay, man, try try to stand straight. Can't do it. <clears throat> Three times he did that. Nothing happened. So he thought, well, okay, I, I prayed for this man long enough. I, and there's a bunch of people waiting. I'll pray for the next one. But when he turned around, he suddenly saw a vision of Jesus. And he was looking mad. I don't think I want to see that. He was looking angry. He said, I said, in my name, you will cast out devils. And he said back to Jesus, yeah, but Lord, I just, I did it. And he didn't go. Jesus said, I said, he will go. He said, yeah, but Jesus, he didn't go. And he said, then Jesus got really mad and he said it strong. I said, he will go. And then he realized that, oh, 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 oh. I'm not using the authority Jesus gave me. I'm watching what I see. So he called a man back up to the stage. He said, come here, come here. He cast that thing out in the name of Jesus. Go, leave this man go. And then he didn't say, try to move. He said, move. And the man went, oh, yep, all perfect. Why? He wasn't trying. Trying was the sign of unbelief. Try and see if you can do it. No, Jesus said, I said. It has to go. It had to go. But he couldn't stand there half in uncertainty, half in doubt, and half believing. See, Jesus gave us that kind of authority. That man was set free because he said, in Jesus' name, out. Back to Ephesians 1. Remember he said, the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. The exceeding greatness. I don't want to just think about that man. The exceeding greatness of his power toward us. I like that phrase. His power toward us. Just personalize it. His power toward me. Exceeding greatness of his power toward me. It's there for me. That exceedingly great power. What am I afraid of? Why am I hesitating? What makes me uncertain? What am I fearful or nervous about? His exceedingly great power is there for me. For me. The exceeding greatness of his power. The love of God. You can't break God in little pieces and say, well, now he's going to be powerful. Then he'll be loving. Then he'll be judgmental. And then he'll be whatever. No. It's all one God. If he's judging, he does it with mercy. He does it with justice. When he's being powerful, his love doesn't go away. The love of God is always there for me. Let's end at Hebrews chapter 4. Because of that. Because that exceedingly great power is towards me. Let's look at Hebrews 4. Mm. Start at 13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. That one who sees everything where you can't hide or make excuses from is merciful. So, I don't need to come to God and say, well, I couldn't help myself, God. It was just kind of a hard day, and you know, forget all that baloney. God... I messed up. I just kind of got into my my flesh. I just kind of let myself go. And I said what I should. No, I did what I should. God, help me here. Please help me here. I don't have to be afraid to come. He says, come with confidence. Hey, come on, come on, come on. I know you. I know you. There's nothing hidden. You have nothing. To, you can't fool me anyways. 
Just come on. I saw it, and I still love you. On those good words, I saw when you messed up, and I still love you. Come on. Let me help you out. If we don't come, he can't help us. It says, draw near so we can receive mercy. Oh, yeah. And find grace to help in time of need. I need help, God. I'm in trouble now. Okay. Okay. I'm right here. I'm going to help you out. Let's take care of this thing. Don't do that again. Let it go. But now let me take care of it for you. Isn't that a good God? This mighty, powerful God. It says, come on, and I'm going to fix what you need fixed today. Oh, we love you, Jesus, that you're so good to us. In spite of your great, wonderful power, you use it toward us. You use it to help us out. Thank you, Father. Thank you that we are not your enemies, but your friends. Thank you that you called us by name and you said we belong to you. Thank you for the privilege of hearing your voice, the privilege of walking with you day by day. Help us to remember, Lord, that we don't faint and we don't shrink back when we're in trouble, but we run straight to you and receive mercy and help. Thank you, Lord, in your name.